Thank you, James. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, as, as James said, I, my day job is, is running the, uh, the Green Building Council in the UK, uh, but uh, one of my other pastimes is chairing uh, the Zero Carbon Hub. Now, what I want to do in the next sort of uh, 12 minutes or so, and hopefully these, um, uh, this will work. Um, no. Okay. How do we... Yeah, that's what I did. There we go. It's changing on there, but not on there. While we are grappling with this little technical hitch, which I'm sure will be um, very, very quickly resolved, uh, what I want to say from the outset is I don't really want to talk to you about the zero carbon policy in the UK uh, or, or even the, the Green Deal in the UK. What I really want to try and focus on is squeezing out some of the lessons learned over the last 10 years or so. Uh, which uh, really, I think, support what James was just saying, which is to say that I believe that collaboration, working in partnership, is absolutely crucial. Uh, and having just listened to, to those uh, opening speakers in the, in the main hall there, you know, none of us can be under any illusion about the scale of the challenge or, if you prefer, the opportunity that we've got ahead of us. Um, but I believe that all the answers, in fact, are... Thank you. Uh, ..to be found in the kind of relationships that we build across the private sector and across sectors, across the public, private and third sector. So that, that's what I'm trying to get at. Now, hopefully this will work. Yes, there we go. So as I say, I just want to really very quickly give you a sense of why did we create a thing called the Zero Carbon Hub in the UK? How did the mission and the vision around that target really help to galvanise industry to overcome some and uh, many complex barriers? How did that enable and really uh, catalyze a new form of collaboration and how can we take some of the lessons from that to inspire new ways of working in what is frankly a much bigger and much more challenging environment which is the retrofit agenda so let me just glance back this is very much looking back to the, st the start of my personal uh, in involvement in this whole area uh, in 2001 um, having just come back as it happens from a couple of years living in the Himalayas I found myself trudging around a building site that was to become BedZ, um, a, a rather uh, a famous uh, little development of about 100 live-work units in South London. And that inspired me, and I think there's something very powerful about that, I might say, to actually have living, breathing examples of what it is we're about uh, should never be uh, underestimated in terms of inspiring people to action. That inspired me at the time I was working for the WWF, the, formerly the World Wildlife Fund, to run a campaign called One, Mil One Million Sustainable Homes. And that really was my first foray into really collaborative working. I needed to understand why we weren't building low to zero carbon homes, highly sustainable places for people to live and work as a matter of course. And the only way that I could do that and understand what the challenges to that were was to surround myself with people who really understood this industry. And that's exactly what I did. So I brought together house builders, financiers, product manufacturers, all sorts of people with an interest. Uh, many, uh, I have to say, had an interest in telling me that what I was doing was, was completely impossible uh, and completely ridiculous at the time. But I surrounded myself with these people and began dialogues that really have persisted ever since. That campaign was one of a number of um, factors uh, that contributed to the housing minister in the UK standing up towards the end of 2006 and launching a thing called the Code for Sustainable Homes, uh, which was built really on the foundations of Bream and Eco Homes, um, and crucially committing the UK to a target that all new homes uh, from 2016 would be zero carbon. Now, I remember standing at the back of the room when, when the Minister Yvette Cooper at the time said that, and there were a few gasps of disbelief from some of the house builders I was standing beside, uh, who sort of muttered to one another and said, my God, you know, if, that's, if we knew that's where we were going, we wouldn't have started from here. And um, there was... But there was an amazing contract, actually, that had been, in effect, signed between politicians and the house-building industry in the UK at that time, led, actually, by the um, Home Builders Federation. Because what they saw, really, was a deal to be done, an exchange for... Uh, an eye-wateringly uh, 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 ambitious target to deliver zero-carbon homes with, in return, uh, some real clarity about the trajectory and the, and the trajectory of government policy and regulation. For the first time, they were being told, this is the way regulatory change is going to step up 
in three increments in 2020, 2010, 2013, 2016. That's the agenda against we need now to invest and to innovate and focus our energy. And that was worth a huge amount of this industry. And that was the basis of them signing up to the target. Now, as soon as the target was announced, the minister convened the 2016 task force, bringing together a broad section of cross-sector uh, cross stakeholders uh, who would sort of preside over this challenge and monitor our progress towards it. So again, bringing together all of these different stakeholders and crucially uh, suggesting that that task force should be co-chaired by her herself, the housing minister, and the executive chairman of the Home Builders Federation. So from day one, forging a partnership between, between the private and the public sector. And what we've seen over time is that that's built in phenomenal resilience. I think we're now on our seventh housing minister in the UK since the introduction of this target and a complete change of government to the coalition government. And yet this policy survives and was restated uh, in the last budget report just a, just a month or so ago. In 2008, end of 2007, 2008, we really started to run into trouble in terms of this definition of zero carbon. What, the, what was this actually going to mean? And at that point, the newly formed Green Building Council stepped up and we said, well, we think we can help. And we think the way that we can best help is to bring together, once again, a cross-section of all the different stakeholders who are going to be influenced by this. So we brought together large house builders, tiny house builders, product manufacturers, local authorities, NGOs, Frankly, a group of people who violently disagreed on what the definition of zero carbon should be. But we got them to work together, and in work together they did over a period of about six months. And at the end of that six months, by which time we said we've got to come out with some kind of consensus about the way forward, that's exactly what happened. And it was extraordinary because many of those people came out to uh, uh, expound a, a, and promote a definition of zero carbon at that point that was quite different from what they'd had in their minds when they started that process. And that agreement, that consensus, has endured since May 2008. There has been no significant dissent from that, the basic structure of zero carbon, which, as I say, I haven't got time to go into today. Um, the, uh, the government at that time also commissioned a review of house building in the UK, uh, John Calcutt, who was previously the chief exec of uh, Crescent Eccles and Homes, and one of his recommendations was that we really needed to operationalise this zero carbon agenda. We needed to create a working forum uh, to really overcome the barriers uh, and make sure that we were going to deliver uh, as per the timetable. And so, again, uh, the recommendation was to create a multi-stakeholder forum to be called the Zero Carbon Hub. Um, I was asked to, to, to sort of scope this, this hub and subsequently to chair its board. And I'm not going to, again, get into detail here about the operations or exactly how this works. I'm just really going to make the point that this was created um, to bring together all of the different people, from policymakers to builders, who were actually going to have to implement this. Um, very important principles underpinning this. This was a completely independent forum. It wasn't led by green groups or uh, 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 you know, existing house builder groups. This was, a, this was a forum created with this policy and this policy alone in mind. And that, I think, was, was, has been crucial uh, to its success. And this, just to uh, re-emphasise the, um, the earlier point, is actually what the uh, trajectory uh, to zero carbon uh, looks like. Um, and this, although there have been tweaks uh, to the policy and so on along the way, that we could talk about offline. Again, this is underlining the crucial uh, element for the industry about clarity and certainty of when they are going to have to deliver uh, these higher standards that has enabled uh, many of the biggest house builders to, to invest and gear up to be prepared uh, for zero carbon homes delivery uh, from uh, 2016. The hub, I'm, I'm very pleased to say, is something that I've been very proud to be a part of for the last few years, and I was delighted when the RSA stepped forward last year and said we would like to research the hub and write this up as a case study. <coughs> Excuse me. And if anybody is interested, there is a whole book which summarises the story of the Zero Carbon Hub, but just a quote here extracted from that, uh, which shows that this really has been recognised as a very... Um, productive, uh, a very creative forum that really has moved uh, the level of, of uh, multi-stakeholder engagement around a policy objective like this to a whole new level. 
And that is something that I really hope will uh, be uh, sort of cross-fertilised into other areas of policy making and implementation. And uh, that's what I'd like to come on to in the last uh, few minutes. This is what our carbon reduction trajectory looks like in the UK. It's a pretty scary thing. This was taken from the Committee on Climate Change report, uh, obviously reflecting back against our UK uh, Climate Change Act, uh, which puts us on a trajectory for 80% plus carbon emissions reductions by 2050. One of the things I always find fascinating about this graph is when you look at the point at which you, you see what our carbon emissions will be in 2050, and then you look back in time to when we were last emitting carbon at that level, it takes you back to about 1850. So we're going to have people aspiring to 21st century uh, lifestyles emitting carbon at the rate that we were in the 1850s uh, when we had a third of the population. Um, now, just in case you thought that was a big challenge, um, uh, let me put that in further into perspective. In the UK, we've got 26 million existing leaky homes. Uh, and as I'm fond of telling people, that means we have more homes than we have minutes between now and 2050. So we've got quite a refurbishment challenge on our hands, or as I prefer to think of it, a huge opportunity. And again, the story here, very, very briefly, is one of collaboration. Back in uh, 2008, we got together hundreds of different stakeholders uh, who were interested in this challenge. Uh, we sat in rooms like this, we debated these topics to try and prioritise what were the key barriers uh, to refurbishing our existing housing and building stock. Unsurprisingly, one of the biggest barriers was the lack of upfront capital. People typically weren't sitting at home with tens of thousands of pounds in the bank, just itching to spend it on insulation. Um, so we said, we have to find a way over this barrier. We have to enable people to get the finance they need because we know this stuff makes sense. As we've already been hearing, we know this stuff will pay back. <coughs> so we set up another one of our task groups populated with members from right across the industry from retailers to contractors to product manufacturers to registered social landlords to agents, valuers, government officials, you name it. Um, and we developed the pay-as-you-save mechanism, the basic principle that said we can lend you money today, you can pay it back out of the money you save in your energy bills over 25 years. We got this idea developed. We took it to everybody who we thought could have a go at knocking it over. They failed to knock it over, and so just before our last general election, we took this policy idea to all the main political parties, uh, and it was adopted by all of them in one form or another. And uh, down in the bottom right, you can see there a wonderful picture of our splendid uh, Chancellor, George Osborne, uh, known, of course, for his green credentials, um, coming to our offices in London to launch the Tories' vision of the Green Deal. Uh, and we've continued to work with the government on the development and the implementation of the Green Deal and continue to do so. The point I'm trying to make, of course, is that this would not have been possible without the collaboration of many people um, across many sectors. We are now looking at how we are really going to gear up to deliver refurbishment using the Green Deal. It's only one mechanism, but to really galvanise the industry around retrofit, Recently, under a, another group that I chair, under the Green Construction Board in the UK, we commissioned a feasibility study to create a hub in the existing homes and building space. And we are currently uh, deliberating uh, exactly how this can be set up with the support of both government through the Department of Energy and Climate Change and the private sector, learning the lessons we have learned from the Zero Carbon Hub. Key lessons learned, I think, the huge target of zero carbon changed the industry's mindset. We went from incremental changes, little tweaks to doing things a little bit better, to a huge step change in ambition. I think the biggest revolution we've seen has been psychological as much as technological. You know, products and, 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 and services in the end are not the barrier. It is about getting people to think into the right space and then work together to find solutions. That's required a collaborative approach, and these hubs have facilitated that sort of approach. Building a progressive consensus, evidence-based, independent of any one particular uh, agenda. Um, absolutely critical for, for the policy makers in the room is clear targets, consistent timeframes to create the conditions within which the private sector can invest and innovate. Given those conditions, I never cease to be amazed at how the industry can respond and come up with the solutions. So huge opportunities, but I think collaboration is absolutely key. 
I'll stop there. Thank you.